Are you wondering how a book can help you promote your business? Well, on today's video, I'm going to share with you an interview with someone who is going to show you how you can make the most out of your own book. Hello and welcome. My name is Maggie Carey. I am your host. I am the owner of Master It Media, a social media agency based in New York. And on today's episode, I am going to be sharing with you an interview with Larissa. Larissa is an amazing business owner. Her motto is that you can say anything you want about her as long as you end with, but she's a genius. I have to agree, because as a company's founder, Larissa's mission is to help aspiring authors to unleash the power of their books on the world and use them to grow their business. As a mom to her beautiful little girl, her goal is to set an example for her daughter that they can both be proud of. As a wife, she hopes to inspire her husband and create a life that is full of love and laughter. She has such an amazing energy and she knows how to help someone else with their brand. And here we go. Here is Larissa. Hello, Larissa. Hi. I Hi. haven't heard my bio read like that yet. So that was phenomenal. Thank you. Oh, thank you. My background in theater helps. I did not want to butcher your last name. So first and foremost, I want you to introduce yourself to my audience and tell them a little bit about you and how you and a little bit about your story how you became who you are today with the gorgeous purple hair <laughs> thank you i put my hair on special just for you in this That's call great. so my name is larissa sewen a little bit of a complicated last name i get that and when i got married i was like oh i i, I my last my maiden name was brown and i was like oh i'm gonna trade up for a better name and i'm like oh that's so much harder to say now so now i have a complicated first and last name so I got started in the publishing space roughly four years ago when I published my first sci-fi book accidentally. I wrote, I, I sat down to do something entirely different and, you know, roughly eight weeks later, I had written an entire hundred thousand word novel and then another six months and it was published. And it happened so quick that I didn't really know what was happening. And that is actually the foundation for why Next Page Publishing exists is because, because I didn't know what was happening, I was open and vulnerable to be taken advantage of. I actually ended up signing with a vanity press that I thought was going to help me achieve all of my wildest dreams when it came to publishing. I was going to be rich, famous. They were going to make a movie about my book. I was going to like be a millionaire and turns out, no, that doesn't actually happen in the publishing world. So when I took a step back from my experience and just how heartbreaking it was and it was at a time in my life when I really needed wins. I really needed something good to be happening in my life. And so to be taken advantage in, being, it was hard. I, I still struggle with it because it shouldn't have happened the way it did. And so when I stepped back and I decided, what, what am I going to do when I grow up? Who am I going to be when I grow up? I knew I was in love with the publishing world. I knew that this, my future was here. I just didn't know what role it was going to be in, whether it was going to be as an author, because yes, I... I loved every moment of creating my masterpiece, but I also really enjoy teaching. I really enjoy collaboration and working with people and getting mastermind type relationships set up so that we can all build off of each other. And when I looked at my skills, I'm a bang up teacher. I'm an awesome mentor Toot toot my own horn over here, but I'm good at what I do. And so when I looked at all of that, I said, well, I think the only option I have is to go into publishing, is to help other women primarily not go through what I went through. So I stepped out of the fantasy world, out of the sci-fi world, and into nonfiction because I knew that's where my coaching skills lied. And the rest is history. You know, we're multiple six figures later, a couple of years later, and it's just been a phenomenal ride. <laughs> Oh my gosh. And it, it is like, I didn't know you had that sci-fi background, right? Because that's one of my, you know, I'm a little geek. I love sci-fi. So, you know, it is very interesting how, you know, you took a passion, you tried it. And I, I applaud you for persevering because some people would just have caused, called it quits, right? And mm -hmm. said, I'm done. So with, you know, with our agency and our listeners, they 
often are struggling with, should I do a book, right? And we, we talk primarily about social media as your way of expressing yourself on, you know, to the world, like to be out and about. And we see a lot of authors using social media. We see a lot of authors who don't use social media. But I want to flip the script for this next question instead of, and I did say flip the script because yeah, but that being said, we want, I wanted to ask you, like, explain to our audience, right? Many business owners and entrepreneurs really overlook the power of authorship and their marketing strategy. Um, from your extensive experience, why do you believe writing a book would be critical component to a comprehensive marketing strategy? And do you, do you think that this is a way they can uniquely position themselves in their market if they had a book? Oh, that's a big question. That's like a like that's like a six part answer. So let me roll out my <laughs> red carpet to, you, to the information. You can kind of, you can kind of like, yeah. Uh, I mean, because I'm sorry, I, there's probably a whole consulting session with you that question, <laughs> but you know, in in a, I guess I'll, I'll do my best to bite size that that yeah, question. I, so. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, that's okay. It's it's a good question because it's a question that everybody has. The 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 question that the problem that people are facing is that everyone and their dog seems to be writing a book right now. It you know whether it's a collaboration book and they're just doing a chapter, whether it's a solo book, everyone is claiming, especially the title of best selling author. And so even the market of becoming an author is getting saturated. So now the question isn't, should I or should I not write a book? I think at this point, that's pretty clear. The answer is yes, you do need to write a book. All of our big names in our niches, in our industry, all of the up and coming, all of the thought leaders, they are all writing books. And there is a very good reason for that because it's, the, it's like one of the most trusted forms of information transfer, of knowledge transfer is the written word. We trust it. The first book was published over 500 years ago and it has stood the test of time. So that's not going away. The problem becomes how do you distinguish against the over a million books that are being published every year? And that really comes down to your strategy, just like you just said, your marketing strategy, your media strategy. What are you going to do when the book is published? 40% of the work is actually writing the book. 60% of it is marketing it. And I know that is a heartbreaking strategy. I hate that. I hate that as much as the next person, but it is not a, a tool that you can write it and they will come. It doesn't work that way. You have to be thinking strategy. And what a book does, so for example, I was a, if I was a business owner and I didn't have a book and I didn't have, let's just say I didn't have a book and I didn't have that main thing that I was pushing people towards. I would have social media over here. I might have podcasts over here. I might have mainstream media over here, like press and TV interviews and things like that. I might have my own podcast. I might have a YouTube channel, but all of them, all my funnels, all my systems, my email chains, they're all acting relatively independently of each other. There's nothing that's funneling one to the other. I'm not going on my podcast and saying, hey, check out my YouTube channel. And I'm not going on my YouTube channel and saying, hey, check out this article I was posted. I can if I'm smart, but they're not really good links to each other. What the book does is it becomes that right in the middle, that centerpiece that everything funnels into. And it becomes a little bit of like a spider web effect out of your book. So now you have your book. Every podcast interview you're going to do, you're going to say, hey, check out my book on Amazon, just published it, just got another five-star review. It's awesome. It's changing lives. Inside your book is funnels. You have funnels linking to your book. You have your website linking to your book. Your email signature links to your book. And then within your book, you have your funnels. Wow. Ooh. I, it's, <laughs> yeah, but you know, like we would talk about, you know, okay, you have to have your website, you have to have social media, you have to have an ER, um, you know, an email list, a CRM, something, right? And they work together. Adding the book to that component is certainly one of those things. Like I am at the end stages of finishing a book that I've been working on. And I've got to tell you, it has been a labor of love. And I, I kept not making it a priority, right? Mm -hmm. So I think what, what you're, you know, by adding this fourth component to my strategy, where, you know, one of the things is I'm looking at a painlesspostingbook.com, right? And that's going to be where everything about the book and any subsequent 
um, editions are going to be housed. So it's going to be, you know, get your free chapter. It's going to be get the companion graphics that go with it. Get this right. Like, so having, a you know, but now I'm also going to have funnel, like when they click on a button, it's going to put them into a funnel where there will be right. Like, cause we've got to keep up. It, it was, it's interesting how we're always my, we're always looking for the lead, right? But then when we get the lead, we don't nurture it. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I've been guilty of it myself, you know, so when we're, we're looking at that, this whole process, right? It's getting and nurturing because people are looking for help and you want to stay front of mind. And I'm not saying, you know, by nurturing the lead, I don't mean just spam them with, you know, I'm doing this workshop and I'm doing this, you know, paid thing and I'm, you know, buy this from me. I'm talking about like, hey, did you know, like recently Facebook was down, right? I sent out an email to my entire list and said, hey guys, I thought I was hacked. I wasn't. Facebook and Instagram are down. It's a way of allowing your, uh, communicating with your audience, right? To to keep yourself front of mind. So your book being a part of that, I could see as being so amazing. You know, and, you know, I'm looking at you with your purple hair and I'm so excited. Like I have to get this wig, but, you know, thinking about this and communication, you talk about, I always talk about stage presence because I'm, you know, I am an actor, you know, that is what I am. I, pretend to be a social media strategist in my day job. Like This is what I do, right? But how do people translate their natural charisma into words for a book? Oh, another tough question. Good ones. I love it because it's, you know, and it could be, I'm sorry to interrupt, but it could be a book. It could be your social media, right? It could be your blogs. It could be anything, but uh, yeah. So I'm going to, I'll pass it over to you again. So it's, it, you can see when Maggie and I talk where, where I, I, especially I'm charismatic. I'm using my hands. I got, I got hand tattoos specifically because I use them all the time when I'm talking, but in my books, you will never see that. You will never see that side of my personality. You will never hear like physically hear the inflections in my voice when I get excited, when I'm sad, like you won't, you won't pick up on that. And so what stuns reader or writers the most is that every, if you were giving your keynote speech, it might be four pages. If you are writing your keynote speech, it's going to be 12. It's almost a three to one ratio for every sentence you have that you would say out loud, you need to add two more to capture what's missing, the body language, the tone. Okay. The I need you. I need you to repeat that again, because that was golden. Say that one more time. So every spoken line that you would say in a speech or on a live or whatever you're doing, you need to times it by three in the written world because you are missing. You need to be able to describe body language, facial expressions, tone, that type of thing. You don't get that in writing. So every single line that you would say out loud times by three, and then you have your written statement. The biggest problem we get in today's modern world of written communication, text message being one of the worst, DMs, things like that, is we don't have tone. And people do not take time to go out and explain tone. And yes, emojis have helped with tone, but they, they're so passive. They're so, you know, they don't count. But like, uh, it's, it, it's true. And people, it's interpretation. You know the poop emoji, right? Yeah. With somebody who was using the poop emoji thinking it was chocolate ice cream. I think it was originally supposed to be chocolate ice cream, but you know, society did what it's going to do. So that could be it. But I think you're, you're right. We don't, you know, in my, in my theatrical world, right. We, we talk about how, you know, a sentence, a line could be said so differently depending upon your emotional connection to what you're saying, your character's emotional connection, but it's also 
the reaction. Like if somebody said something to you, your reply is going to be based. If they yell at you, we may end up yelling back. If they, they're they laughing and, and saying something, we may laugh and say something, right? We uh, Sometimes we also reflect to the emotion. Mm. When you're talking about, you know, us going back and forth here, perfect example. But when you're writing something, I, you know, you don't know how it's going to be perceived. So that's a really great, like, I, I'm, I'm like, now I'm starting to think, okay, so how do you use, you know, how do you write in a language that attracts the perfect client? Because we, you know, we, and we talked about this before we came online, right? We said, if somebody can't, um, if somebody doesn't understand tech issues happen, or, you know, maybe there's a, a blip, maybe we're not as reactive as we normally would be, because life gets in the way you have a child, so you know, <laughs> it's like, and it doesn't change, they could be, you know, your child could be 60 years old, and you they're still your child, and they still have challenges you need to help them with. But that being said, you know, when we're talking to somebody is, you know, is it, are there certain words that clients or when you're writing your book that you should use with that perfect client? And also like, you know, how important is it to, you know, how somebody says, oh, I'm in, I'm an esthetician. So anybody with skin is my ideal client. No, it's not. <laughs> no. <laughs> so any, any little tidbits you can drop on that and that would be awesome as well. Yeah. So the, I would just want to address, is it, you asked me, is it important to know what language? It, oh, heck yes, it is. And I think <laughs> the revelation I've had most recently and is we come into business very serious, right? We want to be taken as professionals. We want to be taken seriously, especially if you're like me and you've left the corporate world, which was a male dominated industry. I was in my twenties, like, hello, no voice. You don't get a space in this room. You just get to sit there and look pretty coming into entrepreneurship where we're trying to build our own brands and we're trying to, we adopt what we know. And sometimes that's really yucky. And that's what I was finding in the early days of my business is I was attracting all the wrong people because I was using language that I had learned previously. I hadn't updated my vocabulary, my speaking, my mannerism to attract who I wanted to work with. And since I've made that realization that I am a natural attractor, that if as long as I stick true to who I am, to who my personality is, it doesn't matter what hair color I have on today, I'm going to attract the right people into my business. And if I'm not careful about that, I will attract the wrong people. And I have attracted the wrong people in the past. And that is what leads to burnout because you're, you're pouring from a cup that is drained right dry, right? You can't give anything else to a client that you just, you don't click with. So one of the workarounds, not workarounds, the fundamentals of that is knowing who your, your ideal reader is or your ideal client is. And not just knowing like a name and a picture, I'm talking like knowing their deepest, darkest fears, knowing the intrusive thoughts that they have going on in their head, knowing what lights them up, what makes them happy. A lot of times we get trapped in this world of like, oh, I want to, I want to work with moms. And that's, you'll leave it at that because you think all universal mom problems are the same. Well, we're not. I can tell you very confidently that I struggle every single day to be a mom and I don't love every angle of it, but there are some women that do. They love it wholeheartedly. It's their whole identity. And that is just not me. And so if you're trying to talk to me and this other woman in the same language, you're going to repel one of us and attract one of us or repel both of us because you're speaking to no one. So really understanding who you're attracting, what their beliefs, their values, their core thoughts are about themselves, about the world, it's going to go miles in, in social media, in your written text, your books, your interviews, whatever, know who you're talking to. I love that. And, it, it, you know, I think we, you know, we can't be afraid of repelling the wrong person. And I, you know, I find that in social media, when you kind of run, you know, you run kind of middle of the road, you don't, you, you're not going to be successful, right? Take a stand. 
Mm -hmm. You know, the wishy-washy world is not for the entrepreneur. We are, we are a hard, you know, we're a hard and fast, like dedicated to making things work for people. So I, I absolutely love that. So talking about this and, you know, using, talking about our ideal client, whatever you want to call it, people build their avatars, right? I know now you target a specific niche, right? So your coaches, for, coaches um, why don't, uh, service providers, thought leaders, out of the box thinkers. Yeah. Right. And, you know, and along the same lines where, you know, I'm looking at service-based industries that are, you know, when we have two different niches, right? So I talk two different languages depending on the niche that I'm targeting. But that being said, when you're looking at a book, right? So my book is coming out and you say, okay, so Maggie, <clears throat> you've got your book, you're doing the things, you're promoting it, right? But now it's established. How do you use your book as a welcome mat? For your business, whether it's just coming out, whether it's before, I mean, you know, pre, you know, do you do some pre release work? Do you do, you know, then the release work, then the post release work, then like what happens? Like you have books that have been out there for years, right? Do you still use, I'm like, all right. So question, how do you use the book as a welcome mat to your business? That's the short one. That's the short question. Okay. So yes, I have books that have been out there for years and they still consistently sell on average 20 to 30 a month per book, which is pretty decent considering I don't overly market my sci-fi ones because it's not direct. It, it's a hobby, right? I treat it like a hobby. I get what it, what I need from the hobby, but how it, your business book needs, it's not a hobby. It's not something you passively approach. It's not something you put out there and assume the world is going to find. It just does not work that way. So to lay out the welcome mat to your book, there's a few things you can do. If your book's not out yet, you need to be thinking marketing. If you haven't been marketing from basically day one of like talking about your writing journey, involving people, asking your audience what they want to see, what's the number one thing they're struggling with, sharing little quotes from your book. If you haven't been already doing that, you need to start about four weeks before your book comes out because you want to warm up your audience. And if we think about how social media works, I'm going to talk social media, especially because that's what your, your topic is, but it, we only see about 3% of what everyone posts every day, like the, of, of how many people I have over 1600 people on my Facebook friends list. And I am on there for 15 minutes a day. So the chances of me actually seeing your stuff, if you're posting it once a week or once a month is like zero, I'm not going to see it. So start four weeks before and post consistently for almost every single day about your book, but do it in a way that's not repetitive and slimy. Like, like I said, creating little graphics about a quote from your book or creating a funny realization you had, or sometimes I cry while I'm writing my book. So I'll post a picture of me crying and say, just wrote like an incredible chapter. I can't wait for what this book's going to do. Or, Hey, did you know I Googled this weird, th I have Googled how to kill somebody so many times, thanks to some of my sci-fi books, that it's alarming. But sharing things like that, that bring your prospective readers in on the journey is going to help you on launch day. But you have to know that it extends beyond launch day. It's not a four week effort and then it's done. You have to keep going. And there's a couple of ways you can do the keep going part of it. One is to technically relaunch your book every single year. And I know that sounds repetitive and it can get kind of annoying, but if we think how dynamic our audiences are and how often our friends lists are changing and growing, throwing a relaunch party for your book is a really great way to invite your audience in and almost do like a meet and greet with the author, talk about the book, talk about the process and just dust it off and show people. And then every single thing that you have. So you talked about building funnels specifically for your book, but you also need to build it into everything that you have. You have to do a social media audit. You have to do an email audit, your, your, your banners, everything should say you have a book literally anywhere I look, if I looked at your profile, Maggie, and you didn't, if, and you have a book and I don't see it immediately, I'm not going to dig. I've had people approach me and they're like, Hey, can you help me market my book? And I look at their LinkedIn profile, for example, and nowhere does it say they have a book. And it's like, no, like you haven't done the bare minimum of telling the world you have a book. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm laughing. Cause I, I see that happen all the time. Right. And I'm like, 
you know where it has you know your description right they they'll say ceo of master at media who cares <laughs> you know? what yeah. are you author you know best selling author right like when you say things like social media strategist or book publishing expert those sexy characters show up on linkedin every time you comment every time you post like what are people doing right yeah I know if we don't need to keep it, the best kept secret that's dead. Don't do that anymore. You don't want to be the best kept secret. You want to be the loudest and proudest voice in the room. Yeah. And so I've got a good question for you with this one, because it, it, it dives into my world a lot and a lot with the biggest, one of the biggest pain points I see with businesses. So many of our listeners struggle with creating consistent engaging content for their social media, right? So we're talking about just saying that you're an author and that you have a book, right? But as someone who helps the coaches write books, what are your top tips for repurposing book content into social media posts at, that resonates with your that target audience that we were talking about? I'm going to actually pull a prop because who doesn't love a good prop? This is so this is all, these are all books that we've worked on in some capacity or another in the last two years. Now, this is my book. I'm going to pull this up. This is How to Write a Book, Memoirs and Autobiographies. This is when I was very niche specific and wanting to help the older generation leave their story for the younger generation. But my, my advice around this book and what this book taught me when I was starting my business, this is the book that started my business is if I cannot flip to a page that's meant for my business, if I can't flip to a random page and say, there's three pieces of content that I can repurpose for social media, then your business building book is not ready. So like, honestly, in this one, I have one, two, three, four, four different examples of storytelling, like linear and episodic and things like that, that I can relay to my audience and be like, hey, do you know what storytelling version you're going to use? What approach you're going to take? That was one page at random. I can do it again let's go here marketing oh my goodness how many tips do we think on these two pages so if you can't flip Perfect. to your book and say <laughs> here's three tip three things that i can translate to social media your book's not ready your book isn't going to hit the market and be like oh my god that was so value packed i have to get maggie in my business this woman knows what she's talking about she is full of gems if this is in her book and i paid 20 i only paid 20 for this book. Imagine what she can get me if I work with her. That's what you want your book to do. All right. So you need to repeat the name of the book very slowly and clearly <laughs> so the audience can hear what it is because I, I, I those two kinda... pages alone are value worth the 20 bucks. Yeah. So this is how to write a book, memoirs and autobiography. So if you're, if this, it's not, it's not aligned to my business so much anymore. So I don't talk about it, but still it is an incredibly valuable book that I always have to fall back on. And it started everything. And like I said, like my whole foundation, my whole programs are built off of this book. Everything I did started with this one, how to write a book, memoirs and autobiographies. Awesome. You know, and I, I, I want, to, you know, show the, the, the size of the book, right? Like the, the thickness, right? How thick is that? It's like a hundred, under a hundred, mm, 136 pages and it's a workbook. So it's not massive. But the industry is moving toward, especially in nonfiction, smaller books are better because we need bite-sized information. If and that's part of it, like and that's part of the three. If you can't find three things, again, there's six on this one page that I can pull things from. If you're not laying your information out in bite-sized chunks that people can consume quickly, they are not going to finish your book. I have a book. Mm -hmm. This is not one that I worked on. It's one of the few that I haven't. This one here, and I'm not going to say the name because I, I love the author. I love the content, but the book is about 300, 350 pages long. I didn't finish it. I got halfway through and I said, I get the gist. I'm good. Right. And I don't want people to do that in my book. So I want to keep it short and to the point. I don't want a lot of flamboyancy. I don't want a lot of exaggeration and symbolism and things like that. Get to the point, solve your audience's problem, and then move on and invite them into your world. Right. And I, I find that happens a lot. Like we use a lot of words to express something. And you were saying, you know, when we're talking one-to-one, -one, yes, you know, it, it, the written word is going to have to be 
three sentences for every one. However, like we're not talking about, you know, these massive books. We, I, you know, and it's interesting. I have a how the book I'm working on it is actually quite extensive, but it talks about doing a post a day, right? So it gives mm-hmm. you over 365 posts and ideas, but the it's designed in a manner where it's so you, you know, yeah, I could have shrunk it down to, you know, 150 pages easy, right? But it'd have to put multiple days on a page and blah, blah, blah. It's also looking at the layout. Is this going to be easy? Because it's a reference book, which is a lot different. And I think I love the that length of book that you have. I think, you know, that 150-ish size is perfect. You could do it. You could read it in a few hours. And I I can't stand reading all the like, just get to the point. <laughs> get well, to the point. Yeah. And I do want to clarify around that three to one. That's in storytelling, right? That's when you're trying to evoke emotion and make connections with your reader. That's the storytelling piece. When you're trying to teach a tangible skill, you still need to go through the psychology of repeating it and giving the information in at least one to two different ways. I would say more likely two to three. So if you're trying to teach a skill, you have to be able to describe it in multiple ways so that it sinks into your different reader's brain. In Basically, it's coming in from different angles and it's soaking into your little neurons differently each time you go through it. But you don't want to take a skill and blow it up to the point where they're like, oh my gosh, I get it. Like, let's move on. That's the problem with that one book behind me is like, I get it. You could have summarized this with a title and a tagline and I would have gotten it. And now it's eight pages long. Like, I don't need that. So storytelling is very different than skill teaching. And, you know, when you bring up a really good point too, is that you'll lose your reader, right? It, you, you know, you've lost that person lost. So how important it is to have someone like you in the, in your world, because sometimes we can't see it. Like we think, oh, well, I've got to explain it. You know, this is the way, right. But you're not only saying, you know, make it short and sweet, concise and to the point, but you're also saying, You've got to explain it in different ways because we all learn differently. We all hear and read differently. So how, you know, some of us are visual learners, some of us are auditory, some of us are, right. So, you you know, uh, that, that brings up a good point. We're talking about print and, you know, as much as we say print is not dead, (laughs) people still buy books. My kids are in their twenties. They buy books. They ask for books every holiday, right? Like Mm -hmm. I want this book. It's not dead. And I think, you know, but the nice thing is we have alternative ways to consume them, right? So we have, you know, ebooks, we have, you know, we have our, you know, traditional print media, but we also have audiobooks. How are you seeing the, you know, can we delve into that a little bit? I know I'm kind of going off script with that, but can we talk about audiobooks a little bit? Yeah. So audio, every, every book has a target market, right? Every format of a book has a target market and who you're trying to attract into your business. Audio books are really good if you're trying to attract a, a market, a niche that is notoriously busy and, and multitasking. Moms, for example, I, I listen, I do audiobooks, physical books, and, and ebooks. I do all three depending on my time availability and and where I am and the topic. For example, I listen to all my audiobooks while I'm walking around the park with my dog and it's my way of multitasking, but it also means that I cannot take notes. I cannot be dedicated to that. I cannot, you know, bookmark things and come back to it easily. It's a little bit harder in audiobook. So you have to really understand what it is that your audience is needing and what do you want them to get from it and do as a result of your book. For your book, Maggie, for example, it has 365 days of content, probably not the best audio book, to be honest, because they want to <laughs> see very it. Right? Boring. <laughs> right? You, you're not, not going to read 365 days of posts or try and verbally explain what each one looks like. Not going to work. So it does matter who your audience is for and what the mm. basis of your book looks like. Yeah. And I, I see, you know, too, when we're, when you're looking at, at different, you know, when you have a workbook, for example, some chapters are ideally suited to listen 
and some chapters aren't so it but it's nice to give people that option but you're you're giving us so many valuable tips and tricks i cannot even tell you the the amount of knowledge you just dropped was insane so thank, thank you, you so much for coming but i i want to just any last words of wisdom that you might have for our listeners i think yeah i'm going to take it a little way bit away from publishing specifically and just be yourself in this industry. I, in the last year, I have found myself moving away from that professional demeanor. Not that I'm not professional, not that I don't go to the grindstone for you and your book. I absolutely do, but I am a whole human at the same time. And if I don't honor that whole human side of me, if I don't, if I can't come to one of my client meetings and know that they're going to laugh with me or that we're going to smile and joke and lift each other up, then that's not a solid foundation of a relationship that I want to enter into. And so when you're, when you're coming into business and you're coming into being an entrepreneur, when you're going to write a book, understand who you are at the core, what it is that makes you smile, what makes you happy, what makes you sad, what, if you're a woman, what your hormonal cycles are like, if you can track them, good for you, because I've been trying for years to figure this body out, but understand who you are and what makes you tick. And then you will attract what fills you up. If you can know who you are, you will attract what you need. It's it's so powerful and it, it goes for anything. It goes for your personal life. It goes for your business world. It goes for your brand. It goes, you know, you can attribute this. It, it took me a long time to stop being the person that everybody else wanted me to be instead of being the person I wanted to be. And the minute I stepped back and just said, this is who I am, no excuses. All of a sudden, I'm attracting people that are positive energy, that are, you know, engaging, that are supportive and helpful. Like it's almost like you you find your people because you're not pretending to be somebody you're not. And don't think just because you're a business owner, you can't have purple hair. You can't have, you know, you can't say, you know, you can't drop the F bomb. You can't do that. It's it's an open field. And we're you know, you can't be everything to everybody. So why try, mm-hmm. right? Find your people, make them happy. There's, I refer to this a lot. There's a musical that it has a, a song in it. And in the lyrics, it says, I'd rather be nine people's favorite thing than a hundred people's ninth favorite thing. Oh. So when you look at things like that, you know, stay true to yourself. Larissa is like, as you can see, she goes beyond helping people with their books. She helps them with branding. She helps them find their ideal audience. She helps them establish, you know, their voice, you know, or I shouldn't even say establish, but bring out their voice, right? So she goes above and beyond just helping people get a book published. So I encourage you to follow her in the show notes. There's going to be information about how you can connect with her. I strongly suggest you do. She is a joy, as you could see, to talk to, and she is a wealth of knowledge. She also offers a lot of different services and workshops. She's got one coming up soon. So if you are interested in finding out more, Larissa, why don't you share how people can find you? What's the best way to get in touch with you? Yeah, you can find us at nextpagepublishing.net and all of our upcoming events, all of our programs, all of our offerings are there. And I'm very excited that we are launching a new membership called Author Allies. So if you're looking to go at a slower pace than what our one-on-one coaching programs do, Author Allies is going to be the solution for you to still gain access to whatever is living up in here. And like I said, you can say anything you want about me as long as you end it with, but she's a genius. So you can get access to that genius knowledge through our Author Allies membership and kind of remove some of that pressure of the one-on-one, you got to move, you know, let's get this book in the next year. You're like, no, no, I want to take a couple years. Author Allies is going to be for you. That's awesome. And I love the fact, like, just as we were talking about, you speak to different people, different people have different ways of absorbing content and working. So you're helping people in different ways. And that is just so massive. So Larissa, thank you again for being a guest. I enjoyed this and learned so much. We are definitely going to be following up together and make sure 
that if you have not already subscribed to us, give us that thumbs up. We love our followers to find out what we're doing. And of course, an extreme thank you to Larissa for having for taking the time to educate us all on how we can promote our business through developing our own book. Thanks again, Larissa. Have a fabulous day, everyone. And we will see you next time with Master It Media's Social Media Marketing Podcast.